And the same goes for omega-3. You know, there's omega-3 is, it's probably, I think, one of the most important, you know, nutrients that um, is, it's really overlooked. People just don't even really think about it. So omega-3, there's three types of of these fatty acids. There's the, the the type that you can find in plant sources. So that's alpha linoleic acid, ALA. And then there's the EPA, which is icosapentaenoic acid, and then DHA. Um, and those are the two marine sources that you'll find in, um, in fish, but also you can find them in microalgae, which is more of a plant-based source. There was a study that came out of Harvard, I think it was 2009, which identified the marine sources of omega-3 as basically one of the top six preventable causes of death. Uh, in other words, people are not eating enough seafood and fish. And um, because of that, it was it was calculated that about, I think it was something like 84,000 deaths per year were attributed to not getting enough EPA and DHA from the diet. And this was really comparable to people that were eating trans fats. Everybody knows trans fats are bad. You walk into any grocery store, it's zero trans fats on every packaging thing you can see. It's very much in the public awareness that trans fats are bad. Well, trans fats were responsible for the same number of deaths as not getting EPA and DHA. So it was responsible for 82,000 deaths per year. Um, before I kind of go deeper into that, I mean, it's kind of just, but that makes you think about it. It's like, oh, wow. So the, 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 the same number of deaths were attributable to eating trans fats as not eating enough EPA and DHA from marine sources, you know, fish, for example. And it kind of really makes you think about things because you don't walk into a supermarket and nothing says, oh, this isn't seafood. This isn't getting your EPA and DHA. This is processed. This, you know, but yet everything tells you about trans fats. And it was, you know, just as important, important to get those, you know, omega-3 fatty acids from marine sources. Um, now I say marine sources because ALA, which is the, the, the common um, source of omega-3 found in plants like flax seeds, walnuts, for example, that is actually considered the essential fatty acid because we can convert ALA into EPA and DHA. And so, you know, all the government agencies that comes up with these RDAs and, you know, all those standards that are set, um, basically it goes down to, oh, well, because we can make EPA and DHA from ALA, that's going to be the one that we focus on. The problem with that is that the conversion of ALA into EPA and then subsequently DHA um, is, it's a very inefficient and there's a widespread genetic differences with respect to that conversion. So um, people, some people are great. They have a, they have a, a alteration in the desaturase gene that does the conversion of ALA into EPA and they do it quite well. Um, I would say the majority of people have another version that are not so great at it. And to kind of add fuel to the fire, having too much of vegetable oils, um, omega-6 fatty acids, I don't want to demonize them so much because like you can get, you need linoleic acid, you need arachnidonic acid. It's part of your cell membrane. It's have important functions. Getting them from whole food sources, like walnut, like nuts is great, um, you know, but the vegetable oils are very, very concentrated and a lot of cooking. If you eat out, if you buy processed foods, they're usually cooked and, and processed with vegetable oils. That omega-6, when it's too high, can compete with that enzyme that's required to convert ALA into EPA. And so you may be getting enough ALA. By the way, that's the other problem. People aren't even eating flaxseed and walnuts. They're not even getting enough ALA. So there's so many layers to this. There's so many layers. Um, but that conversion is very inefficient when there's a lot of omega-6. And on top of that, uh, you know, I would say the one, the one saving grace there is that estrogen does dramatically increase that conversion. It makes it, well, I mean, I mean, it's 20, like up to 20% better. And so this is probably because DHA is so important for brain development. And when you, when a woman becomes pregnant, estrogen skyrockets. I mean, it's like hundred times higher than what it normally is. It's, it's, um, it's pretty, pretty apparent that, that nature has figured out a way to at least, um, 
convert all that ALA is possible into EPA and DHA. Um, anyway, so that's where the genetics comes in. You know, there's there's definitely a regulation there. But on top of that, I think the best way, you know, to get the EPA and DHA is from eating, you know, a dietary source and um, and measuring what's called the omega-3 index. So the omega-3 index is measuring omega-3 fatty acid levels, the EPA and DHA, and other, there's other fatty acids as well, but in red blood cell membranes. And it's really important because most of the time when you go and get a omega-3 blood test, uh, the, the plasma phospholipids are measured, which is better than not nothing, but uh, you're, you're really looking more at your dietary intake in the last week or two versus red blood cells, which are 120 days before they turn over. It's a long-term status of your omega-3, kind of like the difference between looking at fasting blood glucose and your HbA1c, right? Like fasting blood, you could have, you could have had you know, uh, you've been intermittent fasting for that day and your fasting blood glucose looks great, but is that a snapshot of what your daily like blood glucose levels always look like? Might not be, right? So um, long-term status, omega-3 index, and th there's been a variety of studies from um, Bill Harris. Bill Harris, uh, he's the co-inventor of the omega-3 omega fatty acid um, test. I had him on my podcast about a year ago. I've actually joined the Fatty Acid Research Institute, which is a nonprofit institute studying a variety of um, the roles of fatty acids in human health. Um, I've joined as a uh, associate researcher, and so I'm doing some studies on omega-3 and brain health. Uh, but but Bill has published a variety of studies looking at omega-3 index and all-cause mortality, cardiovascular rate related mortality. So um, I would say when you get the omega-3 index measured, um, most most people in the United States have an omega-3 index of less than 5%. And um, what, what Bill has shown from multiple studies is that people that have an omega-3 index of 8% have a five-year increased life expectancy compared to those that have an omega-3 index of, of uh, 4%. So 4% versus 8%. There's also um, evidence that it's you know related to cardiovascular related mortality as well. But also a very interesting piece of data um, that Bill published was looking at smokers and everybody knows smoking is terrible for your health. Like what's the, what's, what can you do to accelerate the aging process? Like smoking, right? Smoking um, cigarettes, tobacco is, it's just, it's a, ter it's terrible. And um, this was so interesting. The omega-3 in smokers that had a high omega-3 index. So they were smoking, but they were also eating a lot of fish, supplementing with fish oil, they had an 8% omega-3 index. They had the same life expectancy as non-smokers with a low omega-3 index. In other words, smoking was like being deficient in omega-3. I was just like, I was blown away by that. Like there's a beautiful graph in in, in the paper, um, I forgot what journal was published in, uh, it was a couple of years ago, but I mean, it's just kind of mind blowing. So omega-3 is, you know, there's so many different roles that it plays in the body. It's, it accumulates in cell membranes, um, plays an important role in, in the way transporters and receptors function because all the, those things are embedded in the cell membrane. And so, you know, for example, glucose transporters at the blood brain barrier are altered. They're, they're not functioning well when DHA is deficient and, that can cause, you know, less glucose to get into the brain that obviously leads to many problems. Uh, it's also the, the metabolites of EPA and DHA, they resolve inflammation in a very efficient and timely manner. These are the maricins, the protectins, um, you know, they're, they're the SPMs, the resolvins. These are playing a very important role in inflammation. And I think there has been now enough evidence that inflammation, chronic low level inflammation is a driver of the aging process itself. In other words, not just driving, you know, increasing the risk of cardiovascular disease and dementia and cancer, which it does, but just the process of aging. And, and so, um, and so it's, 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 it's affecting all those things. And, you know, inflammaging is, is a term that's used, which is kind of like, it's the, the activation of the immune system is accelerating the aging process. And it's known as inflammaging. There's neuroinflammation neuroinflammation. And there's been like these seven pillars of aging where you look at all these like physiological processes that are happening, 
like genomic instability is one, you know, protein misfolding is another. And there's also this in like neuroinflammation. Um, the only thing that was really overlapping between brain aging and just aging itself was the, the inflammation. That was the most important thing that was accelerating, you know, everything in the brain and also aging, you know, in, in the body. So, um, having omega-3 is, I think one of the easiest things that someone can do to improve their inflammatory process, to improve the structure and function of their transporters and receptors. And, um, I know you're going to ask me some research I'm most excited about. Um, I'll give you a preview of that. I'm also excited about a new role of omega-3 in muscle mass and, and also sensitizing amino acids in skeletal muscle. Um, so, so, so there's been some work from Chris McGlory, um, who I had on my podcast just yesterday. He's, he's actually shown that, it, that omega-3 is playing a role in disuse atrophy and, and through a mechanism where it's actually, it's not inflammatory. It's not the you know, anti-inflammatory effect of omega-3, it's actually doing something anabolic. It's act, it's somehow affecting muscle protein synthesis. And um, he thinks it's actually sensitizing muscle to amino acids through some unknown mechanism they're trying to figure out. So I think um, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that new research coming out. Muscle mass obviously is an important factor in aging as well. Um, but I do think that, you know, so, so when it comes to omega-3, what do you do? I mean, obviously, you know, if you can eat fatty fish that's high in omega-3, salmon, mackerel, sardines, these are all pretty good sources of omega-3 that are also low in contaminants like mercury, PCBs. Um, by the way, there have been now studies that have come out showing that even though fish have, you know, these contaminants, that the omega-3 fatty acids protect against them and even during pregnancy. So there was this big push, you know, decades ago about, pregnant women should avoid eating fish because of the mercury. I think that was a huge mistake, huge mistake. And I'm actually involved in a study looking at um, omega-3 index in cord blood and uh, neuro, neurodevelopmental outcomes. But um, there, there's there been a couple of studies, you know, one, one, I think big one was in 2015, American Journal of Pediatric published that that basically the omega-3 fatty acids, women eating fish, the omega-3 fatty acids protected against any neurotoxicity. And in fact, um, you know, those children had, you know, better neural outcomes than women that avoided fish. Uh, there's also been studies looking at omega-3, like fish intake and um, intelligence in, um, so, so in, in fish intake during pregnancy and intelligence um, you know, at one year or seven years of life, like I forgot all the, you know, the follow-up times, but, um, it was shown that, you know, omega-3 was correlated with improved intelligence if the mothers were, were eating fish and they were actually using mercury as a biomarker to, to basically validate their dietary recall because the, the women that were taking in more, more omega-3 had higher mercury. And guess what? The higher mercury was correlated with higher intelligence in the children, not because mercury is improving intelligence, but because the omega-3 is and the omega-3 you know, the mercury doesn't, doesn't even matter if you have the omega-3 there, it's, it's really protecting against any potential toxic effects of mercury. So, um, I know that was a bit of a tangent, but it's, it's, it's important because people are kind of scared of eating fish and, you know, there are some fish that you should be scared of like swordfish, which is terribly high in mercury and not so high in omega-3, but things like salmon, wild caught salmon is low in mercury, high in omega-3. Uh, also supplement supplementing is, a, is I think a really important option. So, um, looking at the 4% omega-3 index, comparing it to the 8%, I mentioned the, the five-year increased life expectancy. I think that, um, there's been some studies showing that 1.5 to two grams a day supplemental omega-3 can bring people from a 4% omega-3 index to an 8% omega-3 index. Uh, now to keep, keep in mind, you know, the FDA people are prescribed, four grams a day of either Leveza or Vasipa, which, which is the, um, purified EPA and, and that's very safe. So, um, you know, this is, this is a, this is a, uh, omega three, the way I like to think of it is it's got the new, it's got the safety profile of a nutrient, but it is pharmacologically active and, you know, and, and, and so many people, are not getting enough of it. I think 
something like 80% globally do not get enough EPA and DHA and like 95% of people in the U.S. do not get enough. So uh, very important in respect to the way we're aging. Um, you know, I think it's important for cardiovascular health. I think it's important for brain health and throughout the lifespan from infancy to old age, important. So that's sort of my... Uh, my spiel on omega three. I, I think it's yeah. a, a very low hanging fruit and important thing that people can can um, take in. 